So the title of the sermon this morning is The Requirement of the Resurrection. The Requirement of the Resurrection. And I title it that because the resurrection is not an optional doctrine. You know, there's some doctrines that we could not all agree on. There's some doctrines where we can have fellowship with other people, other Christians, that, uh, you know, if we don't see eye to eye on it, that's okay. We can still be friends. The resurrection is not one of them. Look, if you are wrong on the resurrection, we cannot have any fellowship with that person. If you're wrong on the resurrection, and I'll just come out and say it, you're unsaved. You know, we're going to see that here in a minute. If you deny the bodily resurrection of Christ, you shouldn't even call yourself a Christian. You shouldn't call yourself a Bible believer. And we dead sure can't have fellowship with somebody. Now, when I say have fellowship, I'm not saying we have to completely shun that person or whatever. We can't, we don't have to ask, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the grocery clerk at the counter, hey, do you believe in the resurrection before I do this transaction? Obviously, we've got to go through life and live with people. And I'm saying, when I say we have fellowship, I'm saying we can't make our close acquaintances. We can't have our best friends. We can't be in the same yoke with unbelievers. And that's what somebody is who denies the resurrection. They are an unbeliever. It is, why, and why is that? Why would we draw such a hard line on the resurrection of Christ? And you say, why, you know, and part of the reason I'm preaching this is because, you know, we really didn't have an Easter sermon. It kind of dawned on me recently that we really haven't really had an Easter sermon this year because of the whole COVID thing. So, you know, this is a, but this is a doctrine that needs to be preached on a regular basis, the, the resurrection of Christ. It's an essential doctrine. It's something that we all must see eye to eye on. You know, and I don't suspect that there's anybody in the room that would, that would deny the resurrection of Christ, the bodily resurrection of Christ. Nonetheless, there are people out there that, that deny it. And you might even run into somebody. You know, you might have a family member or a relative of some kind or a friend, a coworker, you know, who believes, you know, calls himself a Christian, but then they also, you know, deny the bodily resurrection of Christ, like the JWs, which we're going to focus on in particular later in the sermon. Look, you shouldn't be, that shouldn't, you shouldn't be, uh, you know, fellowshipping with that person. You shouldn't be having them over, you know, talking Bible with them, jiving with them, hanging out with them, whatever you want to call it. I mean, you should admonish them. You should say, hey, you're unsaved, you know, by all means. But I'm preaching this because of the fact that, you know, you might just run into somebody that doesn't believe the resurrection of Christ. <coughs> it's necessary for salvation. That's why you can't have fellowship with somebody who denies the resurrection of Christ, because of the fact that it is not an optional doctrine, doctrine because of the fact that you must believe in the resurrection of Christ in order to be saved. It's part of the gospel. It's, it's the, you know, the essential part of the gospel to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You can't just believe in the death. You can't just believe in the burial. You also must believe that Christ rose from the dead. <clears throat> you know, and that's something that has to be taken by faith. You know, you can't, I can't take you somewhere and, and prove to you that Christ rose from the dead. You know, I can't, I can't, you know, produce some kind of evidence. It's something that you have to believe by faith. You have to decide for yourself, did Christ raise from the dead or not? Now, let me just, and when, you, when people are thinking about it, I always try to get them to think about this. If somebody rose from the dead today, let's say that happened. Let's say there was a resurrection today. You know, somebody, you know, was wrongly executed like Christ was. You know, they were falsely charged. They got the death penalty. And they were, they were killed, and they were put in a casket and buried. And then three days later, that person came out of the grave and showed himself alive to many witnesses. Do you think that just maybe there would be a blog post about that? Do you think that might just make the 11 o'clock news somewhere? Do you think maybe somebody somewhere would write that down? You know, and that's exactly what happened here. When, you know, you say, where's the proof? Well, you know, ultimately the Bible is its own proof. Look, if somebody rose from the dead, you, somebody's going to write about it. Somebody, that's big news because that's never happened before. No one's ever done that. In the history of mankind, has anyone brought, been brought back from the dead? Now, of course, we look in the Old Testament, we can see examples of God you know, bringing people back from the dead, but not in such a manner as Christ, where he was you know, publicly executed before everybody, you know, declared himself as the Son of God, showed, him, you know, showed many proofs that he had the power of God, that he was you know, God in the flesh, preached many powerful sermons, had the attention of the world at that time, and then was put to death and came back from the dead. You must believe in the resurrection, and you have to believe it by faith. It's not optional. It is necessary for salvation. And if you would, keep something in 1 Corinthians 15, but go over to 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4. Jesus said unto her, 
speaking of uh, Lazarus' uh, sister, uh, Martha, I believe it was, said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I am the resurrection. That's who Jesus was. I am the resurrection. He that believeth in me. So to believe in Jesus is to believe in the resurrection. He's saying, look, I am the resurrection. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Amen. And that's a question we all have to ask ourselves at some point in our life. Do we believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection? Do we believe that though we die, we are going to be raised again by faith in him? <clears throat> and you can't have one without the other. You can't say, well, I believe in Jesus, but not the resurrection. You say, well, who does that? Lots of people. It's out there. It's a thing. There are people out there that say, hey, I believe, I believe in Christ. I believe in God. I believe in an afterlife, but I don't believe in the resurrection as told in the scriptures. <clears throat> but you can't have one without the other. You have to have the resurrection. The resurrection is required for salvation. It is a necessary doctrine. And you say, well, who would ever deny that? You know, who, whatever, what professing Christian would ever deny that? But, you know, I should have had you stay in 1 Corinthians 15 and keep something in 1 John 4 if you're already there, but go to, for, back to 1 Corinthians 15. Even in Paul's day, we saw, we just read this morning that there were people that were denying the resurrection even as recently as when Paul was alive. You know, which was, I mean, Paul was alive when Jesus was alive. So ju just that short time later, there are already people who are denying the resurrection of Christ. You know, and that was big news back then. That was something that spread like wildfire. I mean, the one that came back from the dead, this prophet, Jesus Christ, and his followers, you know, they spread that news throughout all, all the world at that time. They're, they're, you know, it, it was preached, it was published in every nation eventually. But even as soon as then, even as early as that, you still had people who were denying the resurrection of Christ. Look at verse 12, 1 Corinthians 15. It says, Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? He's saying, look, if, if, Christ, if we preach that Christ is rose from the dead, how do you preach that, there's some, that there is no resurrection of the dead? Yeah, some people are denying you know, the, the coming resurrection. But look, what's the point of Christ raising from the dead if, if there's no other resurrection, right? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? He's saying, look, if you're going to deny the, the coming resurrection, you know, that, that is yet to come, then Christ is not risen. To deny the resurrection, then you're denying the resurrection of Christ. And if Christ not be, be not risen, verse 14, then is our preaching vain. He said, look, we might as well just shut up. What do we got to talk about? That's how, that's how essential this doctrine is. That's how important it is. If, if Christ isn't risen from the dead, let's just close our Bible and go home. Let's just stop having church because there's no point. We could, I mean, we can sit around and, and talk about, you know, the, the moral laws and we could talk about how to live a good, godly, clean life. But is that all that we have to look forward to is just clean living? And that's a good thing to look forward to. I mean, there's a lot of benefit that comes with that. But let's not forget the fact that one day as this passage, you know, lays out, we're going to put off mortality and put on immortality. And that's a thought that should really, you know, excite us. That's something that we should dwell on. That's something that we need to get a, a, our minds wrapped around. And, and you know, because that thought is going to help us live this Christian life through the highs and the lows, knowing that one day mortality must put on immortality. The terrestrial must put on the celestial. The earthly must put on the heavenly. That one day we're going to rise in a new body, glorified body. He says, look, if Christ be not risen from the dead, then our preaching is vain and your va faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God, uh, of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so, being that he rise not, the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. I mean, that's the worst part of the news. <laughs> You're still in your, in, your, in, in your sins. That's why he says in verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And not just because we're false witnesses, but because we're still in our sins. Because somebody has not come and died for our sins and, and justified us by being risen again from the dead. And this is so, I'm making the point here of, you know, hey, the resurrection is necessary and there's people out there that deny it. They were denying it even in Paul's day. And even after Paul wrote this epistle and preached and wrote other things, this heresy persisted. 
It's not something that Paul dealt with it in Corinth, and now it's now we just look back and say, well, that's crazy. I'm glad he I'm glad he snuffed out that false doctrine. It continued on, you know, and even into the in the early, you know, the, the the coming centuries shortly after that, in the form of I hopefully I say this right, uh, dos docetism, dos, docetism. I don't know. It's a derivative of some Greek word, d o c e t i s m. You've probably never heard it before, so however I pronounce it, you probably don't care. <laughs> Docetism, whatever it is. Which is, you know, it comes from the Greek word, and again, I don't speak Greek, but I'm just taking the Encyclopedia Britannica at its word here. It says, basically means to seem. You know, it's, it, it's something that appears to be some, oh, a certain way. And this was a heresy that came up back then, which taught that, uh, well, let me just read it. it says Christian, it's a Christian heresy and one of the earliest Christian sectarian doctrines. So it's a doctrine where that broke away from orthodox belief. You know, just the typical standard traditional beliefs of Christianity. It was one of the earliest forms of it that, that broke away and became a sectarian belief, a sectarian doctrine that affir uh, which affirmed that Christ did not have a real or natural body during his life. They go so far as to teach not only to deny a bodily resurrection, they actually even taught that, hey, even during his life, it wasn't even a physical body. It was a spiritual, just ethereal type of body. It, it wasn't a natural body during his life, but only an apparent or a phantom one. And now you say, that's a very strange doctrine, and indeed it is, but what they end up doing, consequently, is denying Christ's resurrection and his ascension into heaven. Because if you deny that he had a physical body, uh, you know, then you deny that he bodily rose again from the, from the grave. You're essentially denying the resurrection of Christ. So we see even back then, Paul was already dealing with it in his day of people that started coming up with these strange and, and perverse doctrines that teach that Christ did not raise from the dead. And here they have this kind of, and they go to this extreme of saying, well, not only did he not have a physical resurrection, he never had a physical body to begin with. <coughs> Milder dos, uh, docetists, whatever you say it, docetists, attributed to Christ an ethereal and heavenly body, but disagreed on the degree to which it shared the real actions and sufferings of Christ. Now go over to 1 John chapter 4. So we see that this heresy of denying the resurrection is something that started very early on. Which is why we're warned in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit. You know, there's going to be a lot of people out there that come and say, Oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, I believe the Bible. There can be a lot of preachers that stand up behind pulpits and, and claim to be men of God and, and claim to know the way of salvation. But the Bible says, don't believe every spirit. It says, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they have God. Now, how do you do that, of course? With the Word of God. You know, we examine, we judge with the Word of God, like the Bereans. You know, we search the Scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. You know, and that's, you know, that... You know, that's, one of the, that's why it's always so strange when people call churches like this a cult. This a cult's not going to encourage you to go home and read the Bible for yourself. They're going to say, you know what, you need, me to t you need me, the preacher, to get up and tell you what the Bible actually says. In fact, you don't even need to bring your Bible to church. And you shouldn't even read it. It's dangerous, right? Like I believe the Mennonites teach that. They, or even the Amish. They'll teach, you know, it's dangerous for you, the layperson, to even read the Bible because it's just going to confuse you. Yeah, because what I'm reading here isn't lining up with what I'm seeing and hearing. But that's, how you, but that's the admonition of Scripture. They, they dead sure don't want you reading that one to try the spirits, to see whether they be of God. Because they know they're not of God. And that's why the, you know, the Catholic Church wants to preach everything in a strange language, in Latin, in some dead language that you, can, you wouldn't even know, begin to know, and tell you not to read your Bible. Because <clears throat> they don't want you to try the spirits and find out everything that they're teaching you is, is unbiblical yep. or extra biblical. It says, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether of they got. Why? Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. That's John saying this. One of the apostles of Christ, even in his day, he's saying, look, there are many false prophets gone in the world already. And we know in the, in the, in the, in the end times, perilous times shall come that... that, that's, uh, that, that, that uh, Seducers shall wax worse and men shall, and evil. So yeah, I'm messing it all up. They shall wax worse and worse, doing what? Deceiving and being deceived, right? So it hasn't gotten better since John's day. It sounds like there's been a decline on the false prophets in the world. If anything, it's gone up. Yep. There's more of them. There's more Christian sects that are teaching, teaching strange things. There's more false churches out there. 
that have just you know billions of people in them, millions of people of them, hundreds of thousands of people in them. And he said, because many false prophets are gone in the world, that's why we're to be not believe every spirit, but try them. Hereby know ye in the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So that's one of the essential things that you have to believe to be a Christian. That's one of the, one of the essential things that we should examine when we're trying a spirit. Do you believe that, uh, that Jesus Christ in the clump is come in the flesh? Talking about that God was manifest in the flesh. Do you believe in the deity of Jesus Christ? And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. And you see it there, in, in, even in Paul's day. Even with these doicists, or however you say it, these people that came and said, Jesus didn't come in the flesh, he came in a spiritual body came in a heavenly body and that hasn't gone away that's just changed you know that's a very strange belief that didn't gain a lot of popularity but look the that the spirit of that antichrist hasn't gone anywhere the spirit that preaches that christ has not come in the flesh that denies the bodily resurrection has not gone from the earth it's still out there whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world it's it's still out there <clears throat> He goes on and says, more, more thoroughgoing doicists asserted that Christ was born without any participation of matter and that all the acts and suffering of his life, including the cruci crucifixion, were mere appearances. They were just apparitions. They were just like, it was, it was like you were just watching you know, a Hollywood movie. It was like you're just watching it play out on a television screen. It wasn't actually happening. It was just appearing to happen. Very strange doctrine. But that spirit... You know, we may not have doicists today. It's, you know, it takes on the form of Gnosticism and so on and so forth. But that spirit of Antichrist that teaches things similar to that, that's still in the world today. That hasn't gone away. <coughs> and it's completely contrary to Scripture. I mean, go to 1 John chapter 1. <coughs> I mean, what a strange doctrine to teach that Jesus Christ never came in the flesh, let alone rose again from the, in the flesh. It's a very strange doctrine. It doesn't line up with Scripture. Look, when we try the spirits with the Word of God, we say this doctrine falls apart very quickly. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, it's talking about Jesus, God, Christ. He was with God in the beginning, right? He was the Alpha and the Omega, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and what else? And our hands have handled with the Word of life. He's saying, look, I mean, John knows he, he was the one that, he was the beloved disciple that rest, that lay upon his bosom. He was that close to Christ. His hands have handled him. Right. He's touched him. He's felt him with his own hands. The word of life. He's felt God in the flesh. He knows he was there. So it's a very strange doctrine, but I'm telling you that this doctrine has persisted in the world. And you say, well, how is that? Well, because of the fact that the JWs, the Jehovah Witnesses today, which is, you know, I've run into quite a few of them here in Tucson. You go out and knock doors in Tucson, you, you run into more Jehovah Witnesses than I have in other places. This, they have a strong following in Tucson. They have almost as many churches here in Tucson as they do up in Phoenix. In a city that's less, not even half the size, right? Maybe a third of the size. But they, they deny the bodily resurrection of Christ. Now, they're not going to go so far as these doicists, these Gnostics, we say, oh, it was all just this mystical apparition the whole time. That none of that really happened. It was just the appearance of it happening. That, that Jesus didn't really suffer. It just looked like he did. It wasn't really him shedding his blood on the cross. It just looked like he was shedding his blood on the cross. It's wicked. Yep. And it hasn't changed. Well, that part has changed. But what hasn't changed is that they deny the bodily resurrection of Christ. You know, and this is right from JW.org. I'm not going to bore you with the entire article. But it's on there. And anybody knows anything about Jehovah's Witnesses, no, this is true. They can't deny this. This is the, on their official website. From an article which stated, The Bible says that Jesus was put to death in the flesh, but made alive, resurrected in the Spirit. See what they're trying to do? there? And they're quoting their perverted... You can't even call it a translation, because it's not. It's just an interpretation. It's a rewriting of the Scriptures, the New World... What is it? The New World Translation or something like that? I'm not sure. It escapes me now. But it seems like they're trying to quote 1 Peter chapter 3, 18. In fact, in the article, immediately after that sentence, they give a bunch of references. 
1 Peter 3.18, Acts 13.34, 1 Corinthians 15.45, 2 Corinthians 5.16. And we're going to look at some of these. In fact, we're going to look at all of them eventually. But they're saying, look, in fact, go over to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. The article states, written on JW.org, though they're not going to deny a physical, you know, that Jesus wasn't just a mere apparition, that he physically was here in a body, because you can't really say you believe the body, that Jesus was in the body, you can't say you really believe the Bible, and then tell me that it was just an apparition, because we just read 1 John 1. It says our hands have handled. It's a stupid, silly doctrine we could you know, easily debunk. But what, where they get tricky is say, oh, we're not going to say that, but we are going to say that, you know what? He didn't rise again in a, in, a, in a spiritual body. He rose again in a spiritual form, not a physical form. And I'm telling you, that is the same spirit of Antichrist all the way from back in Paul's day that is still out there in the world. It's just more subtle. And they try to take, instead of trying to avoid the scripture, they just take it and they try to twist it. They try to twist it, and they try to even put out their own version of the Bible, you know, and teach things. Now, they, they quoted 1 Peter chapter 3. Are you in 1 Peter 3? I had you go to John, didn't I? Go to 1 Peter 3. I'm sorry, I got you going all over the place. I know it's early, but hey, you know what? Hopefully you had your coffee, right? Came, came, yeah, someone's got some already, right? Sipping away. You know, hopefully you're, you're, you're woke up. You can stick, stick with me. I know we're going a little deep this morning, but, you know, that's what we're here to do. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 3 is what they're trying to quote, and they quote it as this, that Jesus was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Now, is that what the Bible says? Is that what the Bible says, that he was made alive in the Spirit? Because the way they're trying to word it makes it sound like, but when he came back, he was in the Spirit. He wasn't in the flesh. But that's not what 1 Peter 3 says. When you actually go to 1 Peter chapter 3, 18, in a King James Bible, the standard by which all other interpretations in the English language are held to it says this for christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but quickened in the spirit no by the spirit he was quickened by the spirit he wasn't made alive in the spirit he was made alive by the spirit because that word quickened just means alive right the quick and the dead we'll see that later go over to john chapter 2 John chapter 2. Actually, go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So right out of the gate, the very first verse that they try and quote, they get it wrong. And that should be enough right there for anybody who's got, had anything to do with these JWs to just write them off for what they are. Antichrist devils. Now, I'm not saying every person that's a JW is, you know, some devil to be, you know, cursed and avoided. But I am saying... You know, we've got to separate the person from the religion that, you know, people that are teaching the Jehovah Witness doctrine, that are, you know, that are, you know, promoting it, that are putting it out there, yep. that are writing it down and teaching it in their churches, they are devils. They are Antichrist. Because right. they deny that Christ has come in the flesh. Maybe not in his first, when he first showed up after the virgin birth, but they deny he's come in the flesh after the resurrection. That is the spirit of Antichrist to deny that Jesus, that to deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh whether the before or after his death. <clears throat> Jesus said in John 2, and Jesus answered and said to him, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Obviously he's speaking about coming in the spirit there. Clearly, right? That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses would have you to believe. That he's saying, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Okay? Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple building. How wilt thou rear it up in three days? See, Unsafe people always choke on the resurrection, yep. like these Jews, like Jehovah Witnesses. But it says in verse 21, he spake of the temple of his body, right. not his spirit. He said, look, when you destroy this temple, we say, and we know from verse 21, this body, I will raise it, this body, up again in three days. Right. It didn't say I'm going to get an extra body, I'm going to load her body, yeah. I'm going to manifest as a spirit creature. Their words, look, Jesus wasn't a spirit creature like an angel. He was God in the flesh, in the flesh, in a body, before his resurrection and after his resurrection. That's what, first, that's what John 2 is teaching. It's clear as day. He said, look, destroy this body, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days. 1 Corinthians 15, where you are. Did I have you go there? Yep. I got you all over the place this morning, right? 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. 
Because this is another passage they, they, they reference. They don't quote it in, when they make this statement. They just throw a reference out there. Uh, just go read 1 Corinthians 15. and Because it's kind of a trickier passage. It could be a little cryptic. And if you go into it with a certain mindset, you could get tripped up by it. <laughs> he says in verse 42, we're going to back up a few verses. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Okay? But he was say, he's not saying that there's, there's a body that doesn't have... It, it's a spiritual body, but guess what it is? It's a spiritual body. <laughs> it's still a spiritual body. It's not this, just this ethereal... It's not, it's not just a spirit. It's a spirit body. Right? You are a spiritual being. That includes your body. But the body that we have is natural, right? It's a natural earthly body. There is a natural body and there's a spiritual body. That's the body we're going to receive. That's the body we're going to have. And so it is written, and this is where they quote, they, just, they skip all that. They skip all the other, the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and just go right to verse 45 and say, so it is written, the first man was made a living soul and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now really, those are interchangeable terms. Living, quickening, it's the same thing. Soul, spirit, it could be the same thing. What he's saying is, look, there's a difference between the old Adam and the new Adam. There's a difference between the natural body and the celestial body. That's every verse leading up to it. That's what Paul's laying down. That's what he's saying over and over again. But verse 45 isn't him just going off on some tangent and just teaching some real quickly, just throwing this out there. That, oh, there's a, there's a natural body, and then after that, it's, a spirit, it's just a spirit. That there's no actual body. No, it's a spiritual body that you have. What he's showing us here is that this speaks to the, the, the new nature of the new believer. That's what that spiritual body is, that quickening spirit. That, that body that is sown, in, or excuse me, rather, raised in incorruption. That's that new creature, which we already are in Christ. We're just waiting for our flesh to catch up which is what will happen at the resurrection. You know, when we die, we're going to leave our, 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 our natural body, this flesh, in the grave, and our, our, you know, we'll depart and be with Christ. But at the resurrection, God is going to bring that body back and glorify it and put them back together again. And that is the spiritual body. That is the, that is the terrestrial putting on the celestial. Okay? That's being transformed in, the, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, as the Bible teaches <laughs> so that's what he's talking about here. Is it's not the fact that Jesus was a spirit spirit creature. That's not what 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about at all. No, you can't read 1 Corinthians 15 if you are saved and have the Holy Spirit and walk away saying, oh, that means that Jesus didn't bodily come back in the resurrection. That's, you're not going to walk away with that. But that's what the JWs, these antichrists, would have you to believe. That deny that Christ is come in the flesh. It's the spirit of antichrist. <clears throat> and here's the thing you can't because here he's talking about he was referring to that new creature okay because here's the thing you can't go to heaven with a dead spirit right when you get saved his holy spirit moves in you know uh, you, you're revived right you have a dead spirit and you're not without a spirit and this is like i know i hate just winging these things out there because this is like a whole nother doctrine that I should probably preach on it's, it's, it can be kind of hard to grasp, but basically, when you get saved, your spirit, the part of you which is spirit, is revived in Christ. Now, does your body change? No, I, and believe me, <laughs> I've been looking, and it's not changing. <laughs> I get up in the morning and I look in the mirror and go, oh, no, guess not, maybe tomorrow, right? <laughs> no, the body stays the same, but the spirit is changed. Right. You know, our spirit is made alive in Christ. We are a new creature. All things are made new. If any man therefore be in Christ, he is a new creature. Not will be, he is a new creature. Yep. That moment. It's just that the body hasn't changed, but one day it will. And you can't, because why does it have to change? Why do you have to have your spirit revived? Because you can't go to heaven with a dead spirit. That's right. You can't go there. You have to have a spirit to go to heaven. It has to be renewed in Christ. Look at verse 46. He says, how about, how be it? That was not, uh, excuse me, just get a drink here. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. 
and afterward that was that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth and earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Like to be heavenly, you have to, to go to heaven, you have to be heavenly, right? You have to have that new spirit. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Look, you can't take that carcass with you. You got to leave the body behind. And if you don't have, if you have a dead spirit, there ain't nothing left to go to heaven, to go be with the Lord. You have to have that spirit revived. And then later, as I talked about, he'll revive uh, the new, uh, give you a new body. But it says this, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. You have to have a new spirit. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. We shall be changed, right? In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corrupt must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. It's necessary to have a, a quickened spirit to be made alive in Christ. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, I already quoted it. It's a familiar passage, but I'll begin reading in verse 16. In 2 Corinthians 5, 16, Wherefore, hence know, uh, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, that we have known Christ after the flesh. And by the way, they also put this as a reference to that stupid statement they made. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, our, all things are become new. So they reference verse 16, which says, no, uh, Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yo, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth now we, uh, know we him no more. And that's confusing. They say, oh, this proves our doctrine, that verse. And, what are they, what are they, and then you have to sit there and go, okay, what are they trying to say here? Because they don't expound upon it in their article. And I don't, maybe there's a character limit or something on their website. I don't know why they don't go into it. You, you care explaining these verses by how you, Though we have known Christ after the flesh, hence, henceforth we know him no more. Yeah, we don't, we don't know him after the flesh in the sense that you know, we're not going to walk and talk with him on this earth. We're not going to be like John and handle him like that. That doesn't mean we're never going to know him again in a spiritual body. What they're trying to say is, well, we don't know him in the flesh because he's made a spirit. That's not what it, but you can't argue that. From, that's an argument from silence. That's not what it means. And verse 17 goes on and explains it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's how we, know, we no longer know Christ in the flesh. Because we're made new. Now we know him in the spirit. Now we know him in the celestial. Now we know him in the new creature, which is in Christ. We don't know him after the old man. We know him after the new man, which is created in Christ Jesus. That's how we know him. Does that make sense? Are you getting that? <clears throat> Go over to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. It says, and that you put on the new man in Ephesians 4 which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's how we know Christ. Not because Christ has made this ethereal spirit after the resurrection and now that's how we know him. We know him no longer after the flesh because we are created in, as a new man in, the righteous, in righteousness and true holiness. We are created by God in a new, we are new. We're the ones that are new. They go on in this article and says, which says, Jesus' own words show that he would not be resurrected with his flesh and blood body. That is a blasphemous statement. That is blasphemy. That's, you know, you're basically calling Jesus a liar. You're calling him accursed. When you say Jesus' own words showed that he would not be resurrected with his flesh and blood body. That's wicked as hell. He said that he would give his quote, here's what they just start quoting. They don't tell you exactly which one of these verses that they're about to reference it is. It said that he would give his flesh in behalf of the life of the world as a ransom for mankind. John 6, 5, 51, Matthew 20, verses 28. If he had taken back his flesh when he was resurrected, he would have canceled that ransom sacrifice. Look, that's just stupid. That's just dumb logic. That's just stupid thinking. Oh, he, 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 he literally dies on the cross in his physical body. They bury him. 
But if he comes back and takes up that same body, well, then the ransom's over. Then that sacrifice is of no use. No, no, because he's, here's the thing. He still died. He still died. It doesn't negate the fact that he still shed his blood and gave his life as a ransom for many. <clears throat> he justifies the, the resurrection by, by coming back in that same body. He gives us hope, the hope that is in us, the hope of Christ, that we also will be resurrected and be like he is. It says, and then and they just throw out these verses that they quote. I showed you how you gone to John 6. Where did I have you go? 20. Matthew. Matthew 20. Go to John 6. <laughs> John 6. <clears throat> if he had taken back his flesh when he was resurrected, he would have canceled that ransom sacrifice. Unlearned and foolish questions avoid, the Bible says. That's unlearned. That's stupid. That's vain jangling to say something like that. And it's blasphemous to sit there and say that Jesus said he wouldn't be resurrected in his own body. When he specifically said, as I read to you earlier, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days, and he was referring to his body. They're saying the exact opposite. That he, that they're saying that Jesus didn't say that. Well, they're liars. They're antichrists that teach this, that believe this. They, if, you know, if you're, maybe, if you're maybe not an antichrist if you believe it, but you're believing what an antichrist believes if you believe this junk. <clears throat> he said in John 6, verse 51, <clears throat> I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any, this, they, I'm reading this because this is what they reference. They make these stupid, blasphemous statements, and then they, this is where they want you to turn and read, okay? This is what they read. They quote John 6, 51. I am the, the, the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Well, there you have it, folks. We've been wrong. The JW's got it right. I mean, doesn't that just clear it all up for you? No, it doesn't clear it up for me at all. <coughs> and it goes on the same, the same thing in verse 52. The Jews had the same problem that J -Hope, the JWs do today. <coughs> Maybe it's just something about those letters. JW, I don't know. <laughs> it says, therefore, they, the, they drew strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They don't get it. Then Jesus said unto them, oh, let me clear it up for you. No. <laughs> he says, oh, you're confused? Let me just double down on that. Let me just go ahead and, 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 and spin you around some more. He said, verily I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink, is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Oh, I guess you can't be saved unless you eat Jesus. And it's, it's you know, people who aren't saved, they all choke on this. You know, no pun intended. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> right? But they do. Right? They all stumble is what I should say over this. Yep. The DAWs, the Catholics, oh, we got to eat his blood and drink his flesh. They enter the Eucharist. Right. Enter, you know, the, the wine. Enter transubstantiation which is not just a difficult word to say, but also a very strange doctrine, which basically teaches that when you eat the Eucharist and drink the wine, that it literally becomes Christ's physical body and blood in your stomach. That's what they literally believe. That at, and it's not Jesus, but as soon as you consume it, it literally turns into Jesus, his body, his blood. And there's, I mean, how much body and blood is there to go around? How many Catholics have been eating Eucharist and drinking wine? I mean, are they rationing here? I mean, what's going on? There's only so much to go around, right? <clears throat> but the JWs, they teach that, you know, they stumble at this too. They read that and they say, they, I mean, they reference that, but they don't want to go to that extreme. <coughs> Where am I here? Go over to, uh, go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. They're saying, look, if Jesus just took back his flesh, if he gave his flesh, you know, like it says, they misquote it, but Matthew 20, it read, the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Say, look, if he gave his life in that physical body and then took it back, you know what? Then it's, it's, uh, it, 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 uh, it would, dis it would uh, disqualify his sacrifice. 
The Bible says in Acts 13, verse 33, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it also is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said in this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. So they teach that, that Jesus, you know, when he died, <clears throat> when he came back from the dead, that he had a spiritual body. That he was a spirit, that he didn't come back in that same body and that, and that what he had, he actually got a loner. <laughs> he, went to the rental, he went to the rental body company and, and said, hey, give me this model. You know, it's got to look like this. It's got to have these features. You know, it's got to have prints in the hands. It's got to have a hole in the side. It's got to look exactly like my old body, so everyone thinks it's my body, but it can't be my body. <laughs> so you want to drive a car exactly like the one you already have? <laughs> so you can fool everybody who think you're still driving the same car? It's, it's stupid, and it makes them a liar. Trying to just deceive people. You know, he's trying to, you know, ha he's trying to have guile. Neither was guile found in his mouth, right? <laughs> but let me read to you from Acts 13. It says, And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. Look, that's a moot point for a spirit creature. Look, if I'm raised as a spirit creature, like the JWs believe, that doesn't, that, yeah, of course it's no more to return to corruption. You know, why even say that? Because corruption, in, 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 is, in another word for corruption is to rot. You know, it, it, things that are corruptible are things that decay. That's another word for decay in the Bible. Look, he raised them from the dead, no, now no more to return to corruption. That's, returning to corruption is not even a concern if you're a spirit creature. The only people that have to worry about returning to corruption are if you have a physical body that, can, that could rot. But he's saying, look, he's raising him up from the dead and that that new body that he has is never going to return to corruption. It's incorruptible. And it says that he did not suffer his, he did not leave his soul in hell, neither suffered his flesh to see corruption. If Jesus came back as a spiritual creature and got another body, guess what happened to the old body? It suffered corruption. It, you know, after three days, a body begins to rot, to swell, turn colors, and turn into, you know, rotten flesh. But he says that he did not suffer his flesh, the flesh that he had, to see corruption. And how did he do that? Did the other body just you know, disappear? No, his spirit came back in, his soul came back into that body, stood up and walked out of the grave. And he showed himself alive. He revived that body. And it was made a new body. You know, it was made after the spiritual, the heavenly at that point. You know, this is, that, that's a moot point for a spirit creature. Oh, you don't have to worry about corruption. Well, yeah, duh, I don't have a, a, a body that could corrupt. <clears throat> Look at, are you in 1 John? Did I have you go there? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Look at 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not ye uh, yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. He's saying, look, when Christ comes in the cloud, in a moment, in the twinkling eye, we shall all be changed. When he appears, we shall be like him. Talking about the fact that we are going to be transformed. That our physical body is going to be changed to be like Christ's body. Which is a really cool thought. <laughs> if you ever stop and think about that. Because when you read the Gospels and you read about the things that Jesus was able to do after the resurrection, you could do that too. Walk through walls, just disappear, manifest over there. You know, and by the way, you could still eat. <laughs> Woo! Which is a relief to all Baptists, right? So you can eat, the, eat some flesh, and, or eat some fish, and so on and so forth, right? And you think about it, well, that kind of makes sense. Like if we're to rule and reign with Christ one day, you know, and as the Bible teaches that some are given you know, or, or, uh, authority over ten cities and some over five, right? We're going to literally rule and reign on the earth with Christ. You know, you're going to need that kind of a spiritual body that can just... You know, oh, got to go take care of business over here. Show up, right, and take care of business. It's a long way from Jerusalem down to whatever city, right? But that's the kind of body you're going to have. You're going to be able to just show up. Look, that's what the Bible's teaching. It sounds like, uh, this sounds like some kind of 
comic book. That's reality. And Christ, how did he leave this earth? You know, well, let's reenact it a little bit, right? <laughs> he kept going, right? <laughs> He'd gone right through the roof, right through the tiles, right through that, right all the way. I mean, that's the kind of body you're going to have. I'm excited. Yeah. You know, I'm, I think that's, that, that's cool. <laughs> you know, and that kind of, and this is not really part of the sermon, but, you know, that's why the, a lot of these superhero movies are kind of, they're borderline blasphemous. Like Superman, they want to like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if you can fly and be like God? Be God-like? Because that is an attribute that I believe we will have in that type of body. Now, are we going to do the things that he did? <laughs> Probably not. Right? But it's, you're going to have some semblance of that, of what Jesus was able to do. That's what it says. We shall be like him. Now, what, why am I turning there? What's the point I'm making here? When will we have that body? At the resurrection, right? We will be reunited with our glorified physical body at the resurrection. And that's what he said over in John 5. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they sh that hear shall live. For as the Son, Father hath life in himself, so he also hath given life in, uh, to, ha the, to the Son to have life in himself and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all they that are in the graves shall hear his voice and they shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I don't want to take time to explain all that. The point is this, is that there's coming a day at the resurrection when the, that which is in the grave is going to, to be risen again. The body is being brought. What do you bury in a grave? You bury the body, right? But he's saying, look, we're going to be like him. When we see him, we're going to be as he is. And part of that process, when he, okay, get the picture, when he shows up, the last trump in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. He's bringing the body out of the grave, right? The physical body. He's changing it into a celestial body. A celestial body, it's still the body, and it's reunited with our spirit, which is in heaven. And it's made a new creature completely. It's, it's, the, it's the whole package at that point. Which means this, that, and he's saying, we shall be as he is. Which means this, that he did the same thing. That he took a physical body out of the grave. He took his body out of the grave and took it to heaven. That's right. That otherwise, we shall be as he is makes no sense. Am I making sense? Here, <laughs> I'm, making, I'm trying to make this as clear as I can. Yep. When you're resurrected, your body comes out of the grave and is reunited with your spirit in heaven, in the clouds, with Christ, and then we shall be as he is at that moment when we see him. Which means, if we're, so if that's how he is, we're like him, he took a physical body out of the grave. To me, it, add, it all adds up. <clears throat> and those that live under the second coming will go into heaven physically. Think about that. I should have gone over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll start to wind this down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter 4, it says in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus shall God bring with him. So God, notice that, that, when, that those that are asleep in Jesus, those that are already dead, God is going to bring with him. Okay, at the second coming. God will bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, meaning those that do not sleep in Jesus, those that are alive unto the second coming of Christ, that go through the tribulation and are there when Christ comes in the clouds, if we are alive and remain, it says there that we shall not prevent them which are asleep, meaning that we're, they're going to go first. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together within the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be in the Lord. So notice that God both brings, those, uh, both brings and raises those that are asleep in Jesus. Did you see that? He's saying, look, don't worry about those that are asleep in Jesus. God's going to bring them with him when he appears. 
But you know, also he goes on and explains that, look, when he appears with those that are asleep in Jesus, he's going to raise those that are asleep in Jesus first and bring them together. And then we shall be as he is. Which teaches again that there is a spirit, that the spirit is in heaven, but the body is raised again and in corruption to die no more and is reunited. Which means that the, the resurrection is a physical, bodily resurrection. Which means that Christ's resurrection was physical and bodily. It wasn't just a loner either. It was his body that he died in that he brings back. I think it's very clear in Scripture. <clears throat> i got to wrap this up. You know, the, J the Jehovah Witnesses would have you to believe that Jesus, you know, they try, because they have to explain this. They have to explain, uh, you know, when he came and showed in Luke chapter 24, when he came and said, he said, uh, what, you know, why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me to have. I mean, anyone who reads the Bible one time is going to catch that. Jesus showed up with flesh and bone. Yep. You know, it's interesting he didn't say flesh and blood, yeah. right? Because flesh and blood cannot inherit, inherit the kingdom of God, you know, which is a whole other doctrine, right? The, you know, it's, it appears that our new body will not have a cardiovascular system because the life is in the blood and we won't have need of that because we have eternal life through the Spirit. Right. Chew on that. <laughs> right? But, he's, but what I'm trying to make is that, look, you can't read the Bible and notice that and not notice that. That Jesus, when he showed up, the disciples said, handle me and see. Look at the hands. Look at my feet. I have flesh and bone just like you. Give me a piece of a fish and I'll eat it. And he showed them his hands and his feet. Now, the JWs, they can't just go, oh, you know, they have to explain that. So they would have you to believe that, Jesus, well, he must have borrowed a body. And, and he must have borrowed a body of somebody who died in the same manner as he did. That's what they literally believe. How do you explain the hand? Well, you say, oh yeah, he borrowed, must have borrowed a body. So he borrowed a body, and what did he tell Thomas? Thrust thy finger into my side. Not, that wasn't the treatment everybody got when they got crucified. Normally they break the legs, remember? When they came, they said, hey, you got to kill him. It's the Passover. So they came to break the legs of the two malefactors that he was hung with. When, when they came to Jesus, he was already given up the ghost. And, they, and then they pierced his side to kind of be like, is he faking it? You know? And they poked him, and out, you know, blood water came out. So Jesus is showing up. The JW, this is what they would have you to believe. Okay? That Jesus showed up in a borrowed body that had the exact same wounds as the one that he was in. <laughs> you know what? And they're not, the, and you say, well, that's a crazy sect that believes that. And they are. And it's a strange doctrine that is, makes no sense is it, and is unbiblical. And it is the spirit of Antichrist. Because they do not believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. But you know what? They're not the only so-called Christians who deny the resurrection. You know, real quick, this BBC article said a quarter of people who describe themselves as Christians in Great Britain do not believe in the resurrection of Christ. So now you've got a, a bunch of people who run around saying, oh, I'm a Christian, but they don't even believe the resurrection. You know what? Then you are of all men most miserable. You know, if we only in this life we have, we have hope of Christ, then we're, we're miserable. Your faith is vain. Our preaching is vain. If Christ be not risen from the dead. You know, a denial of the bodily resurrection is a denial of the resurrection, period. Because that, wh that's what the resurrection is. It's bringing back the body to life. That's, that's literally what a resurrection is. So you can say, well, I believe in a resurrection, just not a bodily one. Then you don't believe in a resurrection. Then you deny the resurrection. And believing the resurrection is essential for salvation. The Bible says, go over to Acts chapter 2. Okay, Acts chapter 2. The Bible says in Romans, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. How was he declared to be the Son of God with power? By the resurrection from the dead. That's what declared Jesus Christ to be the Son of God to the world. So if you deny that, you're denying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yep, right. You're not saved if you deny the resurrection. And I mean the bodily resurrection because that's what a resurrection is. Look at Acts chapter 20. You know, I already read it. I'm sorry. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Last place, I promise. And I got it right this time. 1 Corinthians 15. He said, neither did his flesh see corruption. Right? If we deny the resurrection, we're found to be false witnesses. 
like the Jehovah Witnesses, like the Jehovah False Witnesses was what they should call themselves. Because it's exactly what you are when you deny the bodily resurrection of Christ. <laughs> he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. He's saying, look, here's the, you want to know what the gospel is? What I preached unto you? Which also ye have received and where ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory that which I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Look, he says the gospel that he preached unto you is the gospel by which we are saved. And what is that? Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Look, you can't have the gospel without the resurrection. You can't have the first two without the third. You can't have just the death. You can't have just the burial. You must also have the resurrection. It is an essential doctrine. It is, the, it is required. And the Bible says a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. You know, so let's make a real quick here, a practical application. You know, you're out talking, to, so you're knocking on doors and you run into Jehovah's Witnesses. Ad admonish him once, admonish him twice, and then reject him. I have, I have no interest in spending my time arguing with people about clear, simple doctrine. Because next door, there's a guy who doesn't want to argue. Next door, there's somebody who just wants to hear the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and will get saved. So if I run into some Jehovah Witness who wants to, you know, we'll, and they always do this, oh, turn in your Bible to, uh, go over to this passage in Ecclesiastes. Some obscure passage, some book of poetry that says that, you know, there's no knowledge in the grave, therefore when we die, we don't exist. So I'm like, doo -doo 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 -doo. Why, I'm not going to sit and go, go round and round, chase my tail with these people. The Bible says a man that isn't a heretic of the first and second mission, reject. So if I run a Jehovah's Witnesses that wants to deny the bodily resurrection of Christ, maybe turn him to a passage. Maybe go over to, you know, book of John. Go over to 1 John chapter 1. Go over to, you know, Acts. Show him these passages. Go to Acts chapter 2, verse 29. Show him it. Say, look, it says, he, you know, he's flesh and see corruption. You know, have them explain that. And, you know, if they want to persist, it's like, well, bye. <laughs> Not even have a good day. Just see ya. And, and leave. <coughs> and go. And, and you say, why? Because we don't want to waste our time on people that are going to, you know, make us chase our tail. And you say, well, that's kind of harsh. But you know what? Denying the resurrection of Christ, that's a pretty big deal. And, and when you're teaching people, the, when you're out there actually actively trying to pr you know, promulgate your doctrine and, and publish this abroad, that, hey, Jesus Christ didn't rise in the flesh. He borrowed a body. It's blasphemous to sit there and say that Jesus, did, Jesus never said he was going to come back in a physical body, even though he did say it, and then he actually did follow through and come back in a physical body, his own flesh. It's wicked. All right, so now we, hopefully we can see that tonight, or this morning rather, that you know, the resurrection of Christ is an essential doctrine. Why? Because it's a requirement for salvation. If you deny the bodily resurrection of Christ, you are not saved. I don't care how often you go to your, soul, your kingdom hall or your whatever church, how holy of a life you live, how nicely you, you put yourself together. You deny the resurrection of Christ, you are not saved. You are the spirit of Antichrist. Let's go ahead and pray.